Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, our topic on podcast tips with Rob Greenlee is why video and audio plus live streaming is so powerful. So I've got a terrific guest here, um, but really in the context of the convergence of audio and video podcasting and your your strategy is really, really kind of at the cutting edge of where the medium is today. And in ep this is episode 24 of, of the show. And some of the topics we're going to cover tonight is the rise of live video podcasting on platforms like YouTube and other community building platforms and the immense value that it can bring to, to you and to your community and the opportunity potentially of Spotify video and what those opportunities might bring and its implications for podcasters as we look to the future as well as what's going on with uh, Apple video podcasts too. So there, there's been, you know, an increase of attention and interest in those areas and topics. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And what is short form video content's impact on, on the growing audio and, and video space? And can short form content really, really help you uh, with your podcast growth of your community and your audience and, and how, video formats should and, and or could integrate with your traditional uh, audio podcasting strategies. So th those are just a few of the topics. And we're, we're also going to talk about s some other significant trends that we're seeing in the podcasting space right now as, as creators are out there trying to navigate these very, very difficult waters. And so I wanted to have a little bit of a segment here uh, to just say a couple of things. Tonight, I want to share some perspectives from the heart about how I feel about all of you being here tonight. And, and if you are here, you obviously care about your future and I'm, and I'm really interested in learning new things and, and to be inspired to be a better person to help others and to help yourself. So. That's kind of uh, what we're going to be looking forward to doing tonight on this show. And Elsie Escobar is a terrific guest that can help us kind of fill in on that. And so let's let, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about Elsie Escobar, who is my my guest tonight, which I will bring up on the stage here in a second. She's a luminary in the podcasting field. She's been involved in podcasting uh, since 2007. She's also in the Podcast Hall of Fame uh, from the 2017 class, just like I am. So we both got inducted the same night. And um, so Elsie is a mentor to many, and she's also an advocate for independent podcasters, which I am as well. And But she's also in her full-time job, she's a director of community and content at Lipson, which was the original podcast hosting platform that started back in 2004. So if you weren't familiar with Lipson, I'm going to share a, a little bit more information about the platform and how you might be able to use it as a content creator on StreamYard or if you're using other tools or whatever. And she's also at the forefront of balancing technology which with consciousness in podcasting and is the co-host also of The Feed, which is the long-running official Lipson podcast, which, of, which she's the lead host of with uh, Rob Walsh, who's been a long-time kind of employee of, of Lipson as well. And I, I work with both LC and Lipson for four years when I worked at Lipson. So I'm excited to have her join me. I know we, we've had Dave Jackson, who was part of the team on this show in the past as well. So it's, it, it's great. Um, and also I want to mention that we do have a growing community here and, and I thank you for being here and we are going to do a streamway. That's I said streamway stream yard giveaway at the end of the show. And also our Q and A for this show. So I'm going to highlight uh, questions. If you want to put like a Q sign in the comment field, it'll show up in my my list of comments here, and I will highlight them. And then Elsie and I can cover those questions toward the end of the show, so we, we can have kind of a seamless discussion here. And I'll I'll try and pull up on the screen some of the comments uh, that are more comments, not so much questions. So. So let, let's go ahead and pull Elsie up on the screen and welcome her to the show. So Elsie, thank you so much for getting Hello. on the show with me. Oh, thank Great. you. Thanks for having me. 
Yay. It's great to have you. Is there anything else that I left off uh, from your introduction? I know you've done a lot of things in your podcasting career. Is there anything else that you're working on right now that I, I maybe didn't know about? <laughs> mm, no, I think you did. I think you talked about everything. I think okay. you did. You did good. You did good. You did good. All right. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do here. This is a this is a live show, and I know you do a lot of live shows too, and and I think that that's that's something that you really didn't do a lot of in the past. I I know both of us have primarily done a lot of pre-recorded things over the years, and I've done you know a live streaming show with Todd Cochran for many 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 years. Uh, but that's kind of that that was kind of unusual in the podcasting space for for a while. People doing live shows. Um, so what kind of what kind of trends are you seeing out there that are that that signaled to Lipson and yourself that live was a growing important thing to to do? Or are you seeing that it is an important thing to do? Let's start off with the baseline on it. Um well, I think I first when I first started, um, we we would record our for our show, she podcast that Jessica Kufferman and I uh, had mm -hmm. for a long time. And mm -hmm. what we found is that we would just go live to record the show, mm -hmm. not necessarily to put on the show, but to record the show. We just let people in. And in doing that, we started to see that that's where a lot of people would hang out with us. And we, we would, we built right. a community, if you will, of people showing up to record the show with us. And we really had a good time. It also kind of forced us to, I guess, be on point, be better, even though we still failed miserably, which was the funnest yeah. part of it all when we just lost our way. In yeah. that respect, it was really great. But we only did it for the live component, which was meaning we would just go live and then we did nothing with anything else. Like we didn't even promote, like we had all of these videos on YouTube, but they were all unlisted. <laughs> we never yeah. even published them out. And we had like, hundreds of videos and we never put them out so it was more about the fun and then yeah. when i was at libsyn and, and i started to see like how much fun people were having live on the platform i thought oh we should give it a go because i it was more about the community it was more about seeing mm -hmm. people show up live be able to talk to them at that time be able to kind of put on a show and I felt comfortable doing that. And that's why we started to really push that forward. Uh, and it was, so it was less about anything other than the fact that we wanted to build community. And also YouTube has a really wonderful community as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Oh, look at me. It's my website yeah. Yay, that I yeah. never touch almost. <laughs> yeah. I thought I would pull, pull, pull us up and kind of share a, a little bit about, you know, your, presence and your consciousness like we talked about like i mentioned in the intro um yeah. that you know it's the it's the feeling of this medium is what's important um and and is that kind of you know really driven you over the last uh couple of years as is, is trying to uh reach people as as human beings and and talk to them like that and build build on a foundation of of values is that what you're all about yeah, I actually part of it is that I'm so much more interested in helping people create the content that they want to create right. versus trying to fit into the mold that everybody else is doing. So the types of people that tend to work with me are ones that are already doing things their way. They mm -hmm. know they already have an intrinsic knowledge of the people they are talking to, who their people are. They already know all these things. So, but yeah. they're but they're knowing that they're missing a gap somewhere. They don't quite understand. There's something that hasn't quite clicked for them, and mm -hmm. that's the type of folks that I tend to work with. They're clear on their message. They're clear on their vision. They're clear on the impact they're having in the world. But something's not quite adding up. And yeah. that's when they tend to come to me so I can help mm -hmm. clarify some things as well as, and this is my thing right now, Rob, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm going all in on this now, okay. but it's that Let's transition. Hear. It's the transition between one thing to another, meaning what if you don't want to do a podcast anymore? What if your podcast, the one that you started 
you're mm-hmm. just not interested in doing that anymore. You still like podcasting, but the message that you used to get behind, yeah, you're over it. It's kind of done. It's it's run its course. You've grown up. Yeah. Now what? Yeah, That's I think they call that uh, when I come in. Yeah, I think they call that pod fading, don't they? <laughs> well, you know what? There is a, yes, that is called pod fading. But I think that there's something to be said about. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> Consciously decoupling, right. consciously decoupling from your podcast, consciously decoupling from what you were doing before. And right. what I've seen is that there's a lot of podcasters out there that have had great um, success, let's say mm-hmm. doing a show about, I don't know, food, and mm-hmm. everybody knows them as the food person, and they've and everybody asks them questions about food, and it's doing great. And they are just like, I don't want to talk about food anymore. I just don't want to have this conversation anymore. I don't want to talk about food. I don't want to have people ask me about food. It's it's sucking the joy out of me. And I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to do something else because I'm stuck in a rut of just doing this again. So that's when I, that's when I do the thing. That's when we start to talk through a lot of stuff and see how to transition out of it and everything. Do you see a lot of uh, podcasters kind of going through this phase right right now? I think they're questioning a lot of things in their lives and and what they are what their purpose is. I think are we all kind of in that realm right now with so many changes in our world? Do you think? Yep. I absolutely, absolutely, because we we don't have any that much more time to waste. And I think that part of it is that I've been looking back at myself and at this industry. Now we've we've gotten into it now for two decades, right? Two decades of something. When I started this, I was in my mid thirties. I was not a mom. I was living in Los Angeles. I I had zero responsibilities other than teaching a yoga class. Mm-hmm. And in looking and thinking back now to that person, that's not who I am now whatsoever. The conversations that were important to me at 35 are not the same conversations that are important to me at 52. That's an extraordinary amount of time. And to hold people, especially around in podcasting, to continue to have the same conversation around the same subject for that long doesn't align. And I think now there's a lot of people who are growing up and growing out of mediums or or conversations that maybe that they decided to podcast about to really zero in about because their audiences are also older. Mm-hmm. Or even thinking about somebody like Call Her Daddy, you know, like Alex Cooper started podcasting when she was 27. She's and it's and it was a very specific 26, 27. It was a very specific time in her life. And now all those years later, she's getting to like almost like or like mid 30s now, I believe, or like 33, 34. She has actually aged out of the audience that she started talking to. And so her entire show itself has also matured. It has changed. There's a different type of conversation added to it. There's a more maturity around it. There's a lot more responsibility around it. And so nowadays I see producers starting to mature, meaning they understand the responsibility that comes with having a large platform or having any platform, which wasn't there when we first started. I don't think, Rob, I when I first started podcasting, I was like, I really need to watch what I say. I really I really need to recognize the impact I'm having with people right now when I'm doing these things. Whereas now I do feel that there's a really big impact that our words have to influence culture, especially when our platforms get bigger. Yeah, I tend to wonder if that's driving a lot of the change that we're seeing in the medium right now, that the changeover of content creators, people starting new shows, quitting old ones. And that's why we're seeing kind of the, the medium be a little bit stagnant right now. And just, it feels like, and this is what you're feeling too, that the, just the deck of the boat, all the chairs are being re- rearranged again. 
um, in a very significant way now. And I think, how do you think that's really impacting the content creator and why we're seeing the shift maybe towards more video? Is it just because it's video is more personal? Do you think? I don't think that video is more personal. I think okay. that the creator needs to be multifaceted now as a whole. We, you know, we start, at least I started just understanding audio and recording voice, even though I came from essentially being in front of the camera, I came from, mm -hmm. um, uh, not necessarily video, but I was shooting, you know, TV and film in Hollywood at for a very small amount of time. Please, that sounds so much fancier than it actually is because it wasn't that fancy, but it was very much in front of big cameras. Like I didn't really have a small camera, but all that to say though, Rob, from the get go, when I started to do my yoga podcast, I immediately added I, I actually have a YouTube channel that has over a thousand people subscribed to my channel that came from that yoga, that yeah. yoga class. And from I started to do videos. Ago, right? I was, yeah. yeah, I was doing videos way back before it was even so cool to do video. And I was doing tutorials yep. and I was talking to the camera and I, re and you know, when I used to go live, oh my God, Rob, do you remember you stream? Mm-hmm. I used yeah. to go live on Ustream. Or or Blab for that matter. Remember Blab? I, I, I do remember Blab, <laughs> but Blab was like, I think, after Ustream from when I remember yeah. doing yeah, this yeah. stuff. So yeah. I was yeah. in my apartment, like live doing my yoga classes for the first time. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I was using video from the beginning yeah. to supplement my podcast. Right. right. And I didn't see them as competing mediums. I saw mm -hmm. them as mediums that worked with one another. And this was right. for sure prior to uh, to most social yeah. platforms. I mean, Twitter was there, but that was when Twitter was, it was even hard to put um, images. Remember pick, pick, twit, 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 pick? What was it? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't even <laughs> put pictures up on there. Twit, pick. Right. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. And I used to remember to tell people, I would go, hey, and even in my podcast, I would say, hey, we're going to do this specific yoga class, mm -hmm. but there's a there's a video. You guys, I created a video. If you want to see a tutorial of whatever sequence, you can go check it out. And I had a lot of folks really engage with me on YouTube. Now, the reason mm -hmm. that I stopped producing video even back then, I, can you imagine my YouTube channel now? That would have been amazing. But I right. left it. I didn't even touch it because I was getting so many trolls, Rob, mm -hmm. and it made me quit. It made me quit oh. video. Long, long time ago is what started. you're talking about. Right? Yes, long yes, time ago. Right. yes. In 2006, 2007 is when I, I, in 2008, I think that might have been when I stopped doing video. Mm. Yeah, 2008. I didn't have it in me. I didn't have the resilience in me to right. deal with the trolls at that time because it was really mm -hmm. very negative and it was all based on what I look like. And I didn't have the skills to protect myself against that at that time. Mm -hmm. And so to have people straight up harass the way that I looked, yeah, it was, it was not, it didn't make me feel good. And I just was like, forget it. I'm not even going to go into this platform. This is a cesspool and I don't want to deal with this anymore. So, yeah. So how have things changed on that? I mean, I mean why do you think we're seeing so much of a rise in interest in doing YouTube and doing live right now, especially in the podcast space? It, it, it feels very controversial. I know I argue about it on my other show with Todd all the time, Todd Cochran on the new media show. Yeah. about what's going on with video in the podcasting space and and what do you think is going on with that why why do you think everybody's focused on that right now because it's a lot more visible i mean if you call attention to something it, for number one it's the easiest thing to share a video than it is a podcast to this day yes it is okay. so hard right. to share one of those right so if i want if i have if i'm telling anybody anything and i can go hey 
listen to this podcast or check this out. I'll send a video. My mom will immediately be able to do that. But right now we're getting to a point where if I want to share a podcast episode with anybody, it's so hard because it's like, do you have an Android or do you have a, do you have an iPhone? Do you have, okay. Do you have this app (laughs) or do you you have, you know, and it just becomes a little challenging. So if it's in YouTube, it's so great. Now that said though, the visual medium is so much more evocative to look at and to call attention. You want to mm-hmm. go look at it. You want to go see it. And it, it looks so fancy. Like when you see people sitting behind the microphone and you see microphones and you see lights and you see them looking so cute, like the the way that they're, the folks are framing their, their shows and everything, mm-hmm. you feel that it's so much fancier. Right. Podcasting, audio podcasting on its own, just you recording a show into a microphone is not sexy at all. Sexy in the sense that that looks slick and cool. It's very not that. Usually you're not good looking. <laughs> like you're, yeah. you're in your pajamas. You're like, you know, like not okay. It's This would not be something anybody would want to look at. And yeah. I think YouTube um, as a whole is just such a visual platform, but also short form video has single-handedly made that easier for everybody else because mm-hmm. every single person out there can create a video in just right. a few moments. Right. And 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 posting it. You can create it and you can post it in Yeah, right second. on your phone. Right. Right on the phone. You right cannot do that with an audio, with a piece of audio. You can't right. record something and then shoot it out. Where are you going to put it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's that's exactly the the challenge in its ease of production here. Let me flip back um both of us, but mm-hmm. it's the ease of production is one aspect of it. Plus it's, it's really can be a little more compelling because it it's, I still get back to this concept that it, it feels a lot more personal, um, you know, especially in this age that we're coming into of uncertainty around AI and visual AI and things True. like that. True. Maybe live is going to be the antidote here. And that's why we're seeing a growing interest in, live right. because as far as i know ai can't replicate um live humans quite yet <laughs> no you know what and you're right i think that as it pertains to live trust and things like I, that i do feel that there is a sense of there is a sense of intimacy there is something that i do get out of it mm-hmm. from the lives what i what i mean in terms of not feeling that connection with the video is that Mm -hmm. there's a lot of extra that comes with video on YouTube for podcasts, that there's a higher level of production and that takes away the intimacy for Mm -hmm. me. So the intimacy for me comes from my lived experience when I'm listening to a podcast and I'm walking around the world and I get hit with that insight, I get hit with that bit of knowledge, I get hit with that joke and mm-hmm. I feel like joy or sadness or, you know, awe while I'm in the world. That is the most intimate, the most intimate because that voice has created that experience for you. For video, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're sitting in front and you're watching something. You might be connected, but usually with that intimacy of the person walking around, usually it's more a voyeur to me. In a voyeur type of a way, especially if people are walking around, like I feel that intimacy when I'm watching Instagram stories. When I'm Mm -hmm. watching Instagram stories, I'm all in. But if I'm watching a pre-produced YouTube video, that doesn't communicate intimate to me. Live streams, possibly. Pre-produced, not so much. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's kind of how I'm feeling too. If I th- really, really think about it, I, I'm tendencing. My tendency is to watch more podcasts as YouTube videos in, on my television um, mm. than even even listening or watching on my mobile device. Even though I think most people 
are consuming this stuff on mobile device, especially the shorts. I think that's a huge consumption yes. device. I do not I like shorts. The, the longer form content, I think, is increasingly being consumed on larger screen devices. Um, can, it, it's almost like what we're doing here, Elsie, yeah. is like we're we're replacing television in our lives, right? Where television was in our lives from a network programming standpoint. And what we're seeing is this kind of this shift to the form factor that is available to us, right? If you look at a, a mobile phone it has smaller screens. So, you know, a, a, a shorts type of video that's vertical video makes a lot more sense, right? It's, it, it's compatible with the form factor. Um, longer form widescreen content being on a television, which is typically widescreen and people are sitting in their chairs in their living room consuming it. And I'm hearing more and more research coming out saying that increasing it, even YouTube at podcast movement came out with this study saying that they're seeing more people consuming video podcasts on their televisions. And yes. so you're seeing kind of, I think a shift away from mainstream media um, into internet television of sorts. Oh, and, absolutely. Right. And that's kind of what's I, yeah. behind all of this. Yep, absolutely. I consume my YouTube podcasts on my iPad. So the iPad is my device. The yeah. iPad is what I like right after, you know, a certain, you know, whenever you're finished with your day at work, my let go time is watching YouTube. Like that's, I've just found that to be the thing that I do in the evening. And usually I go watch YouTube podcasts. Like I, I watch podcasts and, um, some of them I listen to. So I do have them in, in my, in Apple podcasts. I have them in my, on my phone, mm -hmm. but I have a preference. There are some of them that I have an absolute preference to watch versus listening. Right. Um, and they, I really enjoy it. I, I, and I actually am a little bit on the obsessed side right now with pop culture podcasts. And so one of my favorite things to do is whenever there is a, a show that comes out on Peacock or, you know, anywhere else like Netflix or whatever. And after that's finished, after the episode has aired or something like that, my favorite thing is to go watch the response on YouTube, because then I feel connected to anybody else who can have a communicate, can have a conversation with me about the show. And so that right. makes me feel connected. That makes me feel like somebody else is right there with me. So it becomes sort of like a one, two punch of content that's coming to me. And sometimes I even prefer the recaps than actually yeah. watching the shows Yeah, right. because there's so much more fun to me. <laughs> you know what I mean, I love that. Yeah. I had uh, Rob Sesternino on the show a couple of weeks ago. Yes. And, and he does that, uh, you know, survivor, uh, you know, reality television type of network. Oh my gosh. Does. Those are my favorite shows right now. Yeah. On, and then it's because I think the fan base is so committed and also what is happening on reality TV. Yeah. It, sometimes it's like oh. such a wonderful way to escape reality to just like. <laughs> yeah, but it's reality up. television. So how is that escaping I reality, Elsie? <laughs> I know. I know. It's really sad. <laughs> but just because it gives you a sense of it's not as you can just obsess over mundane over things that are just not important to the scale that the world is going to disappear you know that you can just right. talk about this stuff and make it matter and somehow that clears my mind and it makes me be able to just like let go which to me is such a godsend. I love these producers so much because I'll go and watch these guys on YouTube. I mean, I, I, I obsessed. I'm constantly refreshing my for you page to see when the, the latest episode is going to pop up. And I go from show to show to show to show. And the longer, the better, like give me a two hour and 45 minute right. episode recap. And you've got me for the evening. Right. And I'm done. I right. love it so much. So
So, but the question is, Elsie, are are they considered a podcast when they do that? Now, Rob Sesternino does put this stuff out as podcasts too, yeah. but not everybody does, right? So the ones that I, I mean, right. I'm not, I'm not going to get into this, those specific semantics. What right, I'm telling no, you is that right. the ones that I watch are podcasts. Like they yeah. have a show that I can watch them, but they are also, I can subscribe to them. So every single one awesome. of the ones that I personally consume has an audio okay. version to it. Uh, okay. And where I'm stuck, and this is where I'm stuck because I, I actually have this question. It, it keeps popping up in my head whenever I'm watching these guys is I want these producers to continue to work. Mm -hmm. I want them to make the money to keep on doing what they're doing. Yeah. I want to make sure that they get whatever is best for them. So does that mean me watching them on YouTube or does that mean me listening to their podcast? Because if me watching them on YouTube is making their ad money be less, I'm going to have to do something because I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, legal mindedness friends. Uh, Karen Cole has a interesting little twist on our conversation about uh, reality TV says I'm not into reality TV after hearing about Russell Brand's, uh, I, I guess he said something that it's all a setup. Um, oh yes, and and of course, yeah. and and but here's the thing, Karen. Here's the thing: these podcasts know this, and they know it so well, and they're so in the weeds about reality TV that they're talking about it in the same way Rob and I are talking about this specific subject that only people that are super into right. the depths of podcasting <laughs> and the nuance of these conversations, they are nuanced. And so when they right. talk about the produce, they know the producers names, they know the years anybody said what they know the first time the fourth wall was broken. They know the, the scenes that were the most unscripted. They know when things like they can talk about this stuff with such nuance, such depth, such wisdom. And they're so funny that that's what captivated me. I didn't know that there yeah. was also an art form to creating these shows and that there's people who are obsessed with that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I feel where the magic of podcasts, whether video or audio are in there. When you've got people who are so passionate about a subject matter that they can make you care about stuff that you would never in a million years wanted yeah. to even know about. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's another comment up on the screen too. The comms unity uh, community yeah. asked the question, so is wrestling, uh, but still yes. has millions of viewers. So if you think about yep. professional wrestling, it's kind of a contrived thing too. Well, one of the reasons it's contrived is that the, I don't think that the uh, sport wants its uh, participants to get uh, injured. So True. that's that's why that's really why it's contrived is that is that they're concerned about the safety of the wrestlers right oh my so, gosh yeah yeah so that's the that's the reality of that but you know there's a common thread here Elsie if we think about it is that this and I think it's at the subconscious level you know let me flip the camera back but um that people are searching for authenticity and they're also identifying in office in authenticity in the world around them yes. in an increasing way. Yes. And this is, I feel like, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you about this stuff too, is because I know you're very much in touch with that. Uh, is, is, is that part of what we're seeing happen is that people are really questioning the world around them and looking for what's real and what's true yeah. because there's so much uncertainty right now. I think that you, yeah, I think so. I believe that that's a huge thing because there is that sense of of dissecting a lot of these conversations around creating content in general, right? Mm -hmm. And really looking at the impact this content has on culture as a whole. And I do feel that um, there are so many 
extraordinarily powerful. And when I say powerful, I'm not saying just because it's going to be like, oh my God, so meaningful in the world. Yeah. Um, but that these creators that have pod that are doing video and also have audio podcasts that are dedicated in this fashion have such a powerful impact or like power with the content that they're bringing to the table that is mm -hmm. so incredibly authentic. There yeah. is a, another, one of my other favorite podcasts that um, I tend to mostly watch. I would say 99% I watch because I need to see it. Mm -hmm. um, it is called the Goulet Pen Cast. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's about pens. And the two hosts are amazing. They are seated next to each other. They, their sound is on point. Their setup is on point. And their show is at least 90 minutes long. And it's in-depth conversation about pens, about fountain pens. Because they have a fountain pen. The Goulet, uh, the Goulet Pens is a pen company. And yeah. they have a store you can buy fountain pens and other stationery but primarily fountain pens and their show is so well done and they go in the weeds i mean in the weeds about talking about pens and showing pens and they have q and a's and everybody shows up in the chat and they have I don't know how many subscribers they have. They have like 250,000 uh, subscribers to yeah. their channels. They have like over 8,000 views uh, to their podcast episodes almost like in two days. They have, and get this, Rob, they don't monetize their channel at all because they don't believe in having ads in their stuff because mm. this channel is primarily to sell pens. And it right. is their, one of their key places for folks to understand about pens as a whole, right? So they do have a show and I don't believe they do a live. They don't do it live. They it's do all upload. It's pre-recorded, pre-produced. It's pre-recorded, pre-produced, but it is. Is it audio very, or It's audio, audio and, video. and video. So they and video, video oh. on video. They Obviously they have the video on YouTube, but they right. also have the audio that I subscribe to as well, but I, I tend to watch them because they are entertaining as all get out. Their faces are hilarious. <laughs> and, and I want to see the pens when they start to talk about the pens. I want to see the pens. I'm a pen, I'm a pen fanatic too. So I love fountain pens. And, and so I got to see the pens. They are, but they do a really great job at describing them and everything. It's so great. They, they have an incredible community that, sends them feedback. They use people's feedback all the time. They use Instagram to get questions from their community on Instagram, and then they play them on the show. It's beautiful. Such beautifully done. Oh, Dr. Vibe, I see you there. You've been in two things that I've done today. Hi, Dr. Vibe. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, that is one of the ones that I just really love. And so you see a lot of people that are doing wonderful things. And I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by both. I'm digging it. Yeah, I think those th those type of podcasts, like you talked about. I mean, there was one that I used to listen to a lot too. It was called The Sporkful, and mm -hmm. it was a show that dissected. Just to give you an example, they would have episodes, multiple episodes, like what part one, part two, part three, of creating the perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Uh... Right? And they would walk you through the the process that you toast the bread at a certain for a certain amount of time and then you have to warm the butter just enough so it spreads equally across and they they would painstakingly explain this <laughs> in their podcast and, it, and back in those days it wasn't video so they they weren't doing it in video but i could totally see them doing this in a video right where they would oh, actually totally. demonstrate how they would create this masterpiece of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? What would be the ingredients of it? How would it be put together? How it would be cut? You know, oh my just, gosh. and it sounds a lot like that, that pen podcast that, that you had. And I don't know what that tells us about what the opportunity is here around niche and getting into passion 
Um, but it definitely has a dovetail there. And I, I also wanted to ask you too, uh, before time gets away from us too much is, um, what do you think about Spotify video? Where are you and where is Lipson in embracing that or not? Or do you think that we're going to see uh, more embrace of video, even in Apple, um, as we look to the future? Because Apple certainly can support video podcasts mm -hmm. and Lipson can support a video podcast as well. They, mm -hmm. they had the infrastructure from the early days. Yep. This particular show is an audio and video podcast in Apple. So you can watch this show in uh, Apple as a video show too. So what's your thought on kind of the emergence of more video, you think? You know, I, this is one, there's a technical aspect of it that I'm still a little bit like, oh my God. Yeah. No. Okay. So when it comes to YouTube, for the most part, right. most people can get the the video and then they put it up on YouTube and it kind of, it's fairly easy. I think most of the time, whatever video you throw at it, yeah, most it will, it will deal with it. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it'll, it'll, um, I, I'm not sure if it re-encodes things for you. I don't understand most of that stuff, but YouTube can basically deal with whatever you throw at it in terms of the type of video that's coming its way and the kind mm -hmm. of codec and the way that it was exported. Yeah. And it actually right? takes audio now through RSS. So yeah, you so can submit it through that too. Great. Fabulous. Now, a lot of the other players, a lot of the other podcast players don't even know what to do with the video because then uh, you're going to have to go, wait, it cannot be an MOV. It has to be an M4, M4, what is it? MP4. It has MP4. to be encoded, you know, the, the H whatever all, with all of the little H, encoding H264 things. and right. Yeah. And right. it has to be this bit rate and that's why it's not playing and how it, you know, it doesn't quite know what to do with it as a whole. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. most people don't even notice what that is. And they, they're still struggling to be able to just get us MP3s with the right yeah. bit rate and having it not be, you know, VBR and having it be CBR. Like people don't even know what the heck that is. We still have to look at that all the time and be able to deal with that. Right. We right. still don't have people leveling their shows to the point where we can actually hear the podcast. Okay. So we're <laughs> still dealing Technology with Technology is supposed to solve that. Right. But it, we hope that it would solve right. it. And sometimes some podcasts, some pod catchers have tried to solve it with using things like voice, voice boost. But then we're putting the onus on the end user again now. And because I, I did a little bit of research, people keep asking me this question all the time. Yes, Lipson supports video for sure. But yeah. so you upload the video, you shoot the video out 20 podcast apps. Yeah. Support. The video, I but think the biggest one does, right? The biggest one does, yeah, for sure. And Spotify, yeah. you can't because they don't well, allow it's only it. on their platform, exactly. Their platform. So then it's like it just is a pretty big platform, so I mean, right? But it's different, it's in a totally different place. So people ask us all the time, and we're like, well, yeah, you can do it, but right. it's only going to, to Spotify uh, to Apple Podcast. And then I have to say that, right. um, right. only a handful of them support people are going to be able to watch your show though, only for yeah. a handful. And then the, then there's about 30 more that support the audio, but they can't right. watch your video. Oh wait. And right. then if the, for the rest of them, they're yeah. not even going to pull your, your file at all. Yeah. I mean, so, I think, so I think like, what you're really saying, if I really summarize what you're saying is that the complexity is getting, getting a little overwhelming is what you're saying. Yes. And it's very hard yeah. because the expectations of the person, they don't understand that that's what's happening here. Now, when it comes to Spotify video, right. I, I watch, when I watch call her daddy, I watch call her daddy on on Spotify, of course, because that's mm -hmm. the only place I can actually right. watch her video, her and podcast. With, uh, like a Joe Rogan there. or somebody like that, too. Is, right. That's, that's For sure. It's the only place that you can see it. And the one thing that right. I do like about the Spotify video component of it all is the community component, too. Like, that's one of the great things about Spotify video. That it's got that stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if we start to it's the fragmentation of it all, Rob, that I'm not sure I'm, 
I'm too keen on. If you could watch my video, like, let's say I say to people and I have this like really incredible podcast episode and I'm, and I say to them, Hey folks, why don't you give me feedback on this? Or like, tell me if you really like this or whatever, whatever, some key piece of information you guys talk, let's, let's get together or whatever. Then how am I going to get all the comments? Am I going to be checking? Where am I going to be checking? Yeah, YouTube, I mean, I think Spotify, but, Apple Podcasts. That doesn't have comments. Sorry. Wait, Instagram. Maybe I told him to go. Into, I have to go yeah. gather them. You know, that's a full time job. Yeah, what's great about StreamYard is I can pull in all the comments from most of the live streaming platforms right into my interface. So I totally. Can see well, that so, to me is cool. I mean, I'm cool with that's, this. This that's is powerful. Cool. Yeah. But when it comes to video podcasts, not live streaming, right? how am I going to get all the comments? Where are the comments going? You're going to have to go to those episodes and look through the comment stream, right? Yeah. So, and I'm right. just like, I don't have it in me right now to do that because it's like, w w that's the part that I really don't like. It's the extra work because there's some of us who are already working so hard to create a show. And if yeah. we start to add all of these other elements, it's just, you're going to feel like you're just drowning with mm -hmm. all of the things you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I think that that's the biggest challenge that that's where the technology has got to help us. I mean, I think, we're way too fragmented now with yeah. um, data and information. Now there's danger in consolidation though, it means that there's somebody that's going to centralize all this stuff. Right. It's also the podcasting 2.0 initiative. It does have a tag that they would like everybody to support uh, and in the RSS, as well as in the listening apps that would aggregate all those comments into one and then share that with everybody. So you basically have like what I have here with StreamYard an aggregation, but then those comments would be shared with all of the other viewing platforms too. Like Facebook would be able to see the comments from, from YouTube or the comments from YouTube could be seen over in Twitter or something, you know, it's being able to exchange this stuff um, is where we're so far away from. You know, to be yeah. able to have that happen, but it is an interesting question. And as we see this shift towards video, it it is going to put more pressure on trying to innovate and try and make this more possible. Even even in RSS, there's talk now with the uh, with the RS the podcasting 2.0 spec having an alternative enclosure. Elsie, I don't know if you looked into this entirely, but having, let's say, an audio and video link in there or a audio downloadable link and a link to, let's say, a YouTube player experience, right, where it would pull in that video or that live video into the podcast app. That's actually currently supported in the Podcasting 2.0 initiative. And so it'd be interesting to see if, if we are going to move into these areas and kind of trying to innovate, integrate, uh, consolidate the media types that people are trying to create in the world now to create a better experience for the podcaster and a better experience for the the consumer of this content as we, I think, shift towards building communities now. I keep hearing more people talk about, we're not building audience anymore, we're building communities. Now, that's a loaded term. And I know you've had many years of building community and how do you see that matches with what's going on in the world today? I mean, is, is community really what we should all be thinking about now? I like the model that Relay FM has mm -hmm. um, because Relay FM uh, is a, a pretty, what I, what I consider uh, an, a, like a, a robust and successful podcast network that was essentially independently funded, independently run. It still continues to do what it is and it has diversified um, in many different ways in order for it to continue to exist. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a group of podcasts definitely that are um, part of this very large network, but they do have a very vibrant community that mm -hmm. they have within 
Discord now, but also obviously social and meaning that they, there used to be a lot more in terms of social, but they're really kind of centering a little bit more in a Discord community. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 community of the podcasters themselves as a network are very much that they are very much a community. They are very much, they know each other very well. They um, promote within each other very well. So this isn't, this is a very uh, friend focused. They, they know each other. They, they know each other deeply and thus from the heart support each other's work. And in doing so, they show up at the discord and going back to the live component is that in the discord chat is where they live stream their recordings. Their re- the, when they are recording the podcast, they only do, I believe they only do audio, I think. And so there's a chat while they're recording and that's how they build their community. It's all that. They have just recently started to do a little bit of video, um, but it is video promotion. But there's a couple, I believe that may, there might be, they've started to publish their, a video episode out onto YouTube. They're starting to build their, their YouTube, but they're not live streaming to YouTube just for their members, right? Now that community is very like-minded, very like-hearted, very committed, and very, very much, um, they believe in the same ethos, even though the podcast themselves are not about the same things, right? Um, Mm -hmm. They're very tech, a little bit more tech savvy, tech, tech tech-centric. And so the people who participate in this community already know how to do all the things, meaning they know how to enter Discord servers. They know how to catch live streams. They know how to enter the chat. They know how to share the stuff. They know how to use social media. They know they know all of the things that a lot of communities that may not necessarily be so tech savvy don't quite know how to do. And it's not so hard when you're dealing with a specific type of audience, like a tech audience. If you tell them, join my Discord server, that's really all you have to say. Whereas if I were to tell people, hey, join my Discord server, they'd be like, what's Discord? (laughs) What is that? What is that? And why do I want to go there? And do I have to have an account? And is that a, what is that? Is that an app? Can I do, you know, and then it becomes a whole other thing. And so in, in that respect, community is, is, I believe what we're looking for, but Community as a whole requires, especially nowadays, not when I first started, actually, but Mm -hmm. nowadays, if you're starting a community, the first thing that you have to do is to understand what the mission and the vision and the values of the community are. You have to have a set rules and regulations from the get go, Mm -hmm. and you have to have a handful of people there to enforce the agreements of this. Because there's going to be rogue characters that are going to get in there and disrupt, right? Absolutely. And and also, you have to understand that nothing is private. So anything that is said in these communities could be screenshots could be taken out of Mm -hmm. context. They could be shared anywhere. So there's a lot more liability that happens in spaces that we want to maintain safe. And in order for them to be safe spaces, we have to really invest time and awareness and attention of people who are minding the space to keep it safe. And that really requires a lot of energy from those that are doing Mm -hmm. that. Because I can tell you also that with my, you know, with a heart wide open, you can nurture beautiful spaces out there online. Absolutely. So, but also what I've seen, unfortunately, Rob, is that the, I'm going to say it, the entitlement of communities is something to behold, meaning they just want all the things and they ask and they take and there's less giving into communities which is why a lot of the what i had felt best communities out there are slowly disappearing is because the toll it takes from the demands of the community itself 
without mm. funding because you don't get paid to run a community. There's very few places that do that. People don't want to pay for communities. People don't want to pay, but they really do require you to give them a lot. And uh, it's rough, man. It's rough going. So has that changed? Do you think in the last few years, for some reason, this, that this kind of, like you said, it's, it's kind of a shocking term to hear from you is this yeah. entitlement. Yes. Why, where's that coming from? Do you think? I think that, you know, what I've seen is that, um, we used to be in a space when I first started in, in podcasting community is what brought me to this podcasting space. Everybody was so giving and nurturing and loving on one another. And, and there was a lot of um, co I'm going to use this term too, co-parenting. <laughs> there was a lot of co-parenting happening amongst the members where everybody would put, put in time and attention and everybody would do a job. Everybody would pick up the slack. Everybody would participate. And now I feel like there's a lot more of a demand of um, the people who are running the community to do a better job and also to have mods, but you can't just have moderators. You also have to compensate moderators in some sh shape or form. And also there are people who just want to take from communities. They're going in mm -hmm. there and they're like, I just want to post my podcast. I just want to, you know, I, I want to sell, sell my course. Or, right, I want to exactly. do my thing. And you're like, well, no, we don't do that. But why? I I saw so-and-so is doing it. How come we can't do it? And it's like, oh, God's sake. So sitting there having to moderate everybody's conversation mm -hmm. is really rough, especially when truly you're not getting, the people who are running these communities are not getting paid. And it just becomes um, that sense of, yeah. And uh, like people think that these communities are there forever and right. they don't need people to invest in them or nurture them. Uh, it's, it's disheartening sometimes to be able to see that where folks demand a lot more versus recognize the amount of time people have put to grow them and to create the space for them. Yeah. It does seem like if we have a, a community that is focused on taking when the foundations of building a community is around kind of give and take, right? Um, that exchange, then then the concept of the community kind of falls apart, I would think. Yeah, it's uh it kind of does, yes, but also, and and mind you, lead that's why I feel leadership is so important. Mm -hmm. In any community, if you are creating a community, you are the leader, you are the head, you mm -hmm. are the glue that it people are going to listen to you have to have the gravitas to show up to to hold space mm -hmm. to um make sure that folks follow your lead to lead by example to teach to show people how to um you know what are the great ways to communicate one and be back and forth to be able to create the that space and in order for, again for you to do that you have to be committed time and energy are the only things that get that done and what i found for myself is that running a community for a long time and then the minute that the um uh life <laughs> takes over such mm -hmm. as children and you have to send that energy to take care of your own home. Like that's kind of how I felt. I was, I was thinking like I can be spending nurturing and growing and teaching and mentoring and guiding and pouring all of that into my children versus this online space. And that's when it actually hit me. Cause I was like, I'm going to learn how to build this community and I'm going to let my kids like, like, I don't know what they're doing. They're like, I have little people in my house and I'm being all like mindful and thoughtful yeah. to this community and like writing this in-depth stuff to my community. And 
but not to my children who are sitting here growing into uh, the adults that I need to I need to model that for my living beings in my home. And that's when it was so hard for me. I was like, oh man, this is, this sucks. <laughs> I have to make a choice. I can't do both. Yeah. So with these kind of societal changes like this, I mean, where do you think we're heading towards? And, and before you answer that question, I, I wanted to remind everybody that I, I, I am going to have a giveaway at the end of the program here for uh, Puddles Duck and a StreamYard mug. So type into your comment field, um, hashtag the yard, just like you've been seeing folks like this do throughout the show. And Elsie has a Puddles as well. I think so cute. That's a I love my little very cute popular thing. brand in the in the world. I don't if you've been to Podcast Movement or one of the podcasting conferences, the Puddles Duck is the first thing that gets snapped up in the so yard booth. Cute. <laughs> I love it. I was like, give me the duck. <laughs> give me like, the duck. Give yeah. me the duck. Yeah. I love it so much. So where do you think that this this is heading us towards? I mean, I think, you know, in the context of this show, it's all about, you know, podcasting and about video and creating community in there. But if we're kind of moving to a longer term, kind of a, a phase in our society and our culture where we're kind of pulling away from each other because we're being too self-interested, right? How do you think that plays out from a family level and a community level and a, even a nation level? I know this is a huge question, but I just wonder, you know, these are trend lines that I have, I, I've never seen before. And yeah. why oh, we're seeing absolutely. it now, why we're seeing it now. I think that there's going to be a balance between, first of all, one one huge transition that's going to happen. I think in most of our of our I guess our, our minds in some way is that mm -hmm. bigger does not equal better. So meaning, uh, you know, twenty thousand person community, hundred thousand person community, whatever it it's that numbers aren't going to equate better. Um, right. I think smaller more intimate and i believe it's going to be a one to one to marriage of virtual and irl type of interactions okay. so it's like the virtual stuff as in like a place to gather mm -hmm. uh, online like a facebook group like a discord server like a slack channel like w however you want to nurture it right so there's that and the component of being able to have occasional real life IRL interactions, mm -hmm. whether real it's connections used. with other people, right? Yes. That, real of the same community could be a small gathering of like 10, 15 people meeting for coffee type of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then adding this type of a component, which is the live component. I've been noodling on Another type of show too, Rob, which is it's a it is a little bit of a round table type of a thing. And I was inspired by another show that I really like what they've done. I'm gonna see, I don't remember the name of it right now. I'm gonna see if I can very quickly find it. But it's uh the show itself to me is really wonderfully executed but doing it sort of like in a uh a round table component where we can kind of all share wisdom and space uh live and then uh have a podcast essentially have have the show be live on its own but for people who can't show up in real life but i do feel that it does need to have those like so l those three pillars which is like the community component the um the real life gatherings and the live streaming or in some way uh communications this way where it would be a maybe one to many and or many to many uh interactions back and forth so that people can start to feel like they belong to something but also mm -hmm. but i think the key component of that is that it's not the 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 key to that success isn't going to be numbers. So it's not like, let's, this is now, 
you know, thousands of people are showing up to my live. I think it's going to, from from what I, the kind of stuff that I would like to see work, and I think it's going to work better, it's going to be any, like the sweet spot's going to be about 50 to 100 tops. Like, that's a sweet spot to be able that's to move. That's about what uh, this show has as far as live, live viewers. Uh, and it's a lot of the same people keep coming back to this program every week. And if you do something, if you create content on a regular basis, that's kind of what happens. And, and I wanted to also ask you, Elsie, too, about um, what your experience is with the short video stuff. And and is that, from what you're seeing, is that translating into conversions into longer form content consumption? Or mm. is it just isolated as just its own thing? And that's how you should look at it. It is not necessarily... Um... I don't think that it directly translates to watching the long form content. It's mm -hmm. a touch point. And so I see it in two ways. Short form content for me is its own piece of content. The best content for short form content mm -hmm. is if it stands alone. If in 15 seconds you get one bit of information there, you've, mm -hmm. you, you've gotten the job done. But you always have to do the breadcrumbs. The breadcrumbs are always the key. So first thing, they get everything they need from the short form. But you always make sure the breadcrumbs are there. So in the description, in maybe an overlay, like you have your little rub greenly thing right up there, right? It says that right there. So maybe there's like a thing where I've said something that's like poignant in 15 seconds. And even if you just have that overlay there, there's that, oh, what is that? Is that a show? Yeah, right? it's a call it's, to action of sorts is what you're saying, right? Yeah, and it's super simple. It doesn't have to be huge. Um, but I have yet not I have I have not seen a conversion like this. <laughs> I've say. tried. I st I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. I have not seen I have not seen it. Okay. Oh, as far as a conversion between to, the from at least from my podcast form. for the feed, I've been I've been promoting the show now consistently using short form video, mm -hmm. and I have seen no correlation between that and and viewership or or listenership like audience, but I yeah. have seen a rise in awareness. So brand awareness understanding that the feed exists and that I have a podcast that has grown for sure. Mm -hmm. But people going, I'm going to go listen to that podcast and follow the show. That has not happened. <laughs> okay. Well, and it's hard to probably trace it too. So, I mean, how do you really know kind of a cause and effect relationship there? Because the, as far as I know, there's no like backlinking unless you're going to use like short, Shortcuts or something. Shortcuts like that. to a long form video. It's probably right. one of the only ways. But other than that, it's hard to trace we, it too. Right. You would have to be immediately looking. And also, like in something like Instagram, which really great is using the direct to Spotify uh, functionality inside of Instagram stories. I think that's mm -hmm. probably one of the the key ways in which people mm -hmm. can directly consume a show. And if there was Apple, I think I said, I don't know when I said this, but if there was direct, th that same type of interaction that Spotify mm -hmm. has on Instagram stories, if Apple podcast had that, it would be amazing. It would be amazing because checkmate. I, checkmate. <laughs> checkmate. Yeah. Cause you would just, because that's what happens right. with Spotify. You just tap yeah. and it yeah. opens it up and you've got, and it's there. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. It's so good. Makes, makes total sense. Um, so how do you think, so if you're doing an audio only podcast right now, Elsie, and you want to kind of move into maybe expanding into, into video now, granted, I have an interest in this show because, uh, this tool StreamYard has that ability to do that, create it once and repurpose, right. And right. to put it in the video, put it into audio, which is exactly what I'm doing with this program. Um, what do you advise to people on how they make that transition from doing an audio only show? So let's say they've reached a certain level of success on the audio only side, but moving into 
in the video, how would you think about that transition? Would it be doing the same show or would you create something different or just short form or it, I, I know it's going to vary a lot based on what the content is and what your, what your goals are individually. But if you were to do it yourself, how would you think about that right now? Yeah. If I were doing like, let's say I was doing a solo show mm -hmm. and I had, I had very little support from anyone. Right. I would probably use, Let's pick let's let's pick Streamyard because Streamyard okay. is great. So let's. <laughs> uh, this is what I'm. What I would do. I would set myself up the way that I am right here, um, with um, a great microphone. So I want to make sure that my audio is on point. Yeah, I that's would. A sure MV7 that you have there, right? This is yeah. an MV7X, not X. plus, not plus X. It's just with XLR. Uh, um, but yeah. but I do have. I have an MV7, but so I would use this. And if you, and then I would, if I had a Mac, I would use continuity camera with my phone to get my mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have that and you don't have an iPhone and you don't have continuity camera, I would use the internal camera on the computer because you're just starting out. Okay. Um, and so I would create my podcast I would get very good at making sure that I'm speaking to the camera and reading my show notes and speaking to the camera and reading my show notes. And I would record everything on StreamYard by myself without going live. I would not go live, not at the beginning. I would just record myself on StreamYard, do my thing, and maybe start to use some of the overlays and craft a couple of pretty something or other where I could press the buttons and do the thing. Mm -hmm. If I start to, you know, lose my train of thought, I would just be quiet. I would let it be no big deal. It would just keep on doing its thing. And then I would pick up again and continue to record. Then I would get that recording and I would use open. Is it Opus clips? That's mm -hmm. what I would use. Oh, Opus Clips and uh, at clip.opus.pro. And I would run that sucker into Opus Clips. <laughs> and then I would, I would make sure that it would give me all the little bits and pieces. And that way I had all of my little videos all set up. Oh, and this other little bit of information that I adore. If I'm going to be investing in any kind of software, I would invest in TimeBolt. And I would buy TimeBolt. And put my my show in there for the video only portion. I would put it in there. I would shoot it through Time Bolt. It would like take away all of the all the quiet places, and I and I would just have a, a finished video file from that, and I would upload that to YouTube. Now I wouldn't do that necessarily for the audio portion, though. The audio portion I would export out the audio from Streamyard because it gives you separate our uh, audio if you are using the pro version or $20 a month. And then I would have like the separate when I would just edit that separately and put the audio into the, into the place. So that's what I would use. So what you're saying is that you would, you would record the audio and the video. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you knew, but streamer just rolled out a new feature where they're um, mixing together in one export, um, the local recordings. So I know I saw yep. that too. I don't know if you saw that or not, but so it is now possible to just export um, both sides of a recording at the same time and have it be local recording and not the the stream up to the server recording, which can have some latency. That's even great. Yeah. Like that. So it's, but you do have to keep the browser open after you're done with the show to make sure that all your audio files and video files upload to the server so they get those local copies. So that's an important kind of, you know, little thing you got to think about. Some people close their browsers up really quick at the end of their shows and they sometimes lose those things or oh, they have yeah. to go back in and reinitiate it again to upload it. I mean, it can be salvaged. So it is a big, yeah. big, big, big problem, but, but that's kind of, and then also um, just to kind of, kind of wrap it up toward the end here, I know, now we're at the hour 15 point and I, I know we wanted to get to take questions, which I've been starring and highlighting in the tool. So I'm up to oh, like 15 good. questions. So yeah. we, we can just take them one after another here. Uh, yeah. And, 
but I did want to ask, are, are there any other significant trends, Elsie, that you're seeing in the space? I know you're, you've been doing this show with Rob Walsh, the, the feed for years, and you're just, uh, you've got your, your ears to the ground on what's happening in the medium. And I know I try and do that too, but I also like to get other people's opinions on this stuff. And, and I value yours tremendously because I know that you've, you're keeping an eye on kind of somewhat a different sector of the industry than even I am. And so are, are, are there things that you're seeing out there that are significant that other podcasters need to know about, about what's happening in the, in the podcasting space and what you see in the video space, anything jump out at you? Very interesting question. Something that comes up, even though that it's it's not necessarily new at all, and I don't think it's significant in the sense that it's going to be like so impactful, is that live events are really a thing. Like they've always sort of been a lot like live recordings of a podcast. Like I know from from when we started, that has been something that has been done in the past. Um, in well, fact, you say I've, live get live. In real very life, clear on that. In real life, life. in real okay. life, yes, in real life, um, and then it sort it it's been sprinkled around podcasting for as long as it started, but it never was really like a big money maker. It used to be a wonderful way to build community that you would create a show and then people would show up and just record with you in a very, in a community space. And then um, it started to pick up speed steam a little bit more right around. I would say that, you know, 2018, 2019 times it started, there were little places that were doing like some bigger shows that were not necessarily your usual mm -hmm. suspects were creating these live events. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit and obviously everything shut down. And then right after everybody started to come out, a lot of shows started to double down on those lives. And so that is now what I have seen as a trend, especially in the larger, I would say, celebrity space, celebrity podcast space. They tend to now come in with the show doing the thing. And now they have a live. Now they have they're 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 traveling. They are touring and they're doing a tour of all of these different places and they're doing it to sell to sold out places yeah they're selling tickets right yeah yes yeah, selling tickets for these live podcast recordings yeah i've seen this pattern too especially on the video podcasting side where or at least on the youtube side where these big creators are doing a lot more in person conversations right yeah. so they'll set up a multi camera shoot not unlike what we're doing here, but you would be in the studio with me in right, this right. case, right? Versus us being in two different states in the U.S. Well, uh, I, I do see a lot of the bigger shows doing that. And and it does create a different kind of intimacy and a different kind of production value that than these virtual things. I mean, I try and simulate it as much as I can with the camera switching back and forth between us. Yeah, yeah. And and but they can actually do it with you know sitting in a couple of comfy chairs and and have a just a conversation and i think that's what i really really like i got the 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 nomano um sound capsule it's actually mm -hmm. behind me up there you can see it on the shelf up there oh, cool. and it, it's got like little lavaliers and you just clip a lavalier on push the record button and you can just start recording and it's all audio so there's no online streaming or live yeah. or anything. And you just sit there and the person that you're talking to doesn't even <laughs> notice that they're speaking into a microphone. That's so and good. They just have normal, just regular conversations and they speak with natural tendencies and they go with their instincts. And, and I think that is a little bit of what you're talking about here is that, and it gets back to this common theme that we've had with this episode. I should have probably titled this, authenticity on on fire in the podcasting space or get real with podcasting or something is the big trend line that you're actually I think, yeah. kind of bringing up here and i think it's awesome yeah i i have been seeing that there is that sense of community of that from those live events where it does become fun I've seen lots of fun stuff. And I know that there are other types of podcasts that do these lives like political podcasts and things mm -hmm. like that which are less fun 
right? They're a little mm -hmm. more uh, obviously knowledge and like it's a different type of conversation. But I do see that that's a trend of of another way that uh, podcasters are diversifying their income streams. Um, and I'm sure that there's overhead for things like that. I'm sure that they have to sell tickets and do all this stuff and which which can be work also. Right. But um, there it depends on the type of venue that they're selling out. I'm very curious about this. I really want to attend one of these events. Uh, maybe if there's like a, a live recording of a podcast near me, I, I want to show up. I want to see how it's happening, you know, and and to meet other people who are part of a community and that listen to a podcast. I think that that's it just feels, I don't know, it just feels like that's something that folks might be wanting to do as well. Yeah, I had a I had experienced these live theater productions of podcasts uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, and they were starting to really take off. And I was going to more and more of them. I know um, some really big podcasts were, you know, renting out, you know, performance halls and theaters and things like that. And they were setting up live performances, podcasts, and those kind of went away because of the pandemic. Um, but they were yeah. becoming very, very, very popular back in like uh, 2018, 2019, uh, even as far back as like 2017, where people, these big podcasters were doing in-person real events where they would in, in fight their fans and people would pay a ticket price to get in and see that. And I, I have seen that come back a little bit more. But I think what we're talking about to some degree is kind of the, the in-studio um, conversations with two people, not the virtual events. I think that the virtual events thing has kind of burned out a little bit to some yeah. degree and people are tired of that. And I think people are wanting to experience more in-person type conversations and in-person type learning and in-person types um, of contact. But yet when I think back to the earlier conversation that, that we had, Elsie, that, that um, it feels like people are pushing away from community. So what is, I'm, I'm wondering if people are really kind of undecided about what they want in some ways, because are they willing to make the commitment that it takes to have an in-person experience and be all in on that? Oh my gosh. It. That's like, yeah, I think it just, we have to scale it down. I would say, I am in my, in my own personal head. Hey, if you want to dream big and think like, Hey, I want to sell out something, a 5,000 person event. Great. Yeah. Go for it. I would rather focus on let's see if i can do a podcast recording for 30 people will 30 people show up yeah i think that's great i think that's a good amount sure. i think i could get to know everybody i think i right. could meet everybody yeah. i think we're gonna have a lovely time together right low overhead just trying to be together keeping it super low-key mm -hmm. and have an experience and see where that goes Instead of yeah. thinking like, let's do a hundred, 300 person auditorium. Right. It, Bigger, the just, better. Right. That yeah. becomes so stressful yeah. to me. I think like, let's, yeah. let's aim enough. <laughs> just <laughs> enough. <laughs> what is enough? Right. What is enough? What is enough? enough for me? Right. Yes. Well, let's, let, let's transition to the Q and A uh, part here, Elsie. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll pull up a few of these questions. I think we've got 16 of it said, hi, hi, Robin, Elsie. It's great to be here and learn from the pros that this Yay. is uh he ryan learn bikes uh learn from the pros cheers from the north shores of lake erie in ontario well Yay. thank you so much from ontario for joining me i know that wasn't much of a question but thank you for the the, the wonderful comment so let's let's see what the next one is here uh park uh bros our show is live every week when we're done recording the show people do not respond as well. Um, I don't know. It, it, interesting. Um, I I guess that speaks to doing the show live. I guess maybe they're responding better to the live show than they are um, recorded version or something like that. Which I think makes sense, though. Elsie, what, what what do you think? I think there's more in audience interaction with the live part than there is with the recording part. 
Yeah, sometimes it depends on people. I think, you know, live time, space, you never know who's going to show up. Sometimes there's a lot more people that, you know, life gets in people's ways. It, you really have to speak to their. And then like, yeah, Bunny says lives seem to have exploded lately. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are everywhere. And a lot of people do tend to be going live all the time. You just have to know what you want, you know, and uh, what part of community you want to be a part of too, right? Yeah, in the basement show with uh, Mr. Nast uh, says, why I consider a show more than a podcast because we have different themes every night. So different themes bring different kinds of people every night. That's cool. So that's, that's interesting. Nice. Yeah, I do like that concept of a variety show. It hasn't mm -hmm. always worked in podcasting because podcasting, like we were talking earlier, Elsie, that people are very niching down, right? It's, yeah. It's this, it's this tension that exists between um, a variety show and a tensioning down or niching down yep. um, is, is kind of worth the struggle that we all have to struggle with here yeah. to try and figure out the path that we want to take down and what's going to work. I think it depends on the topic, I think, really, at the end of the day. And then it uh, looks like Bonnie Bun Gaming, uh, Robot Echo... Commander, uh, wow, trails are always getting out of control. Trolls. Not, trolls, trolls. Yes. Um, uh, we need to put on subscriber-only mode and members-only mode or live commentary um, mode in, in live chat. So I think what, what Bonnie's saying here is that uh, I, I think if we're going to do community and, and to avoid these issues with trolls, I think... I agree with her that a, a filter is a subscription, right? Um, to keep kind of the trolls out. Trolls are probably not necessarily going to want to pay a fee to be in a community. I don't know. Is, is, is that kind of your gut too? Um, I don't know. If I think that you just have to have, well, it, in, in just focusing on the conversation here, I think that moderation is absolutely imperative. Right. So... Either you know way, I, you have to have the moderation, right? Whether it's paid or free. Yes, access. absolutely. You have to have moderation in there. And maybe there are times when subscriber only mode is the way to go. I think that that becomes safe, a safety issue, meaning it becomes a way for everybody to have fun. I can tell you that the bigger you got, you get, the more exposure you have, the more reach you have, the more uh, trolls will get out of control. Yes. <laughs> The the animals will come out and play, right? Is yes. that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, that is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, and then uh, uh, Legal Minded Friends, Karen Cole, uh, same. I had people only when I was on a huge channel uh, with over 800,000 subs. Most comments were, were, were nice, but a few were horrible. I replied, but um, one said, sorry. And they forgot people are real. I, so, yeah, I think this is just this is another testimony of what the risks are, right? Um, mm -hmm. Most people are good, and mo most people try and do the right thing, but there's always a few that ruin it for everyone else. <laughs> yeah, that's Not kind so of great. Yeah, it, yeah. And let's see. And then uh, Bonnie has a further comment, and uh, you can make content, videos, live streams, community posts exclusive to members. So I think what she's assuming is that if you're a member or you're a paid subscriber, something like that, you're likely to be more respectful, but I don't know if that's a hundred percent always true. So, uh, and then uh, legal minded as I went, Oh my God, I had an attorney say, um, I, I was AI. So I got invited on as a guest speaker to his friend's channel and he came on and apologized. So oh I guess gosh. things can happen. This gets back to what we were talking about earlier around people trusting, you know, people online and um, who they are. And increasingly we are going to be challenged by um, this perception that maybe the person that you're talking to is not real. Yeah. AI. So I think that is a real thing that we're going to have to deal with as we look to the future. And there's going to have to be ways of, you know, marking these as different 
um, yeah. that, that we can, I think uh, the, the legal authorities are really working on that right now is to be able to almost like watermark these things, um, these AI generated content or videos or what, whatever that can be flagged as this is not real. Right. So oh, there's going to have to be filters. Oh, yeah. Totally. Right? And so, and then the com uni dash T writes, I love the flexibility of controlling the pace. I can consume more content by toggling the speed and using chapters. Um, I don't know. Is there anything that you. Yeah. Like that, that's that? podcast okay. listening. Yeah. That like, I would say that that's like so easy. It's like, I, I love that, that option fast, quick scroll through. Right. It looks like uh, Norma G writes, I moderate in a cannabis community and it's a very cool community community and a lot of other communities can learn a lot from it. Um, yeah, it's a controversial topic and, and I'm sure that there's, there's extreme personalities in there that have, have very extreme pers uh, personal views on that topic. So I'm sure it's an interesting community to be in. <laughs> and, um, Marcelo Time writes, hi, um, when I'm making a live stream from my iPhone, I cannot put the volume down. Uh, you guys can try it uh, and it doesn't work. Um, hmm, that's, that's interesting. I think that's a stream. I think a stream yard. That must be a stream yard thing. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that one. It has um, something to do with, yeah. Let's see. And also from on the iPad too. So I'm not sure. Yeah, th that's probably an iOS thing to some degree or, uh, yeah. Uh, and then let's, there's just a couple more and we can move on with the giveaway. Say, so, uh, legal minded friends, Karen Cole said, I've noticed the bigger a channel got, the community feel got lost. Um, so is that something that you've seen LC2? Is it once you reach a certain kind of scale with a community, that also is a, is a, a trigger for like maybe a downward spiral. Yeah, I, I have, but again, it depends on the leadership, right? Because when you start a community, you're not thinking, you're not planning for 30,000 people in your community. You're planning for what you see and it can sustain, but then it hits a level. It's like anything else, right? Even with, you know, oh, taxes, right? There's like a point where Maybe you don't need somebody to do your taxes for you. There comes a point when you're like, oh, maybe I need a little bit of help. Maybe I need an accountant. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, my God, I need a specialized accountant because <laughs> I have, you know, three 1099s and a W-2 and I have this other thing here. They got to figure it out. And so the more complexity and the more you add to it, the more you have to invest in having to figure out how do you scale it up. Same thing with communities. You can't run a 100-person community the same way that you run a 30,000-person community. That's You can't do it. So yeah. it's a different set of problems. Yeah, so I think the last question that, that we have here is from Marcelo Time. It says, uh, uh, good, uh, you mentioned that you're going to realize that you know, there's this kind of volume issue, this mute issue when you're trying to use StreamYard on two devices. Oh. Um, and I guess it is possible to do that. So if, if, if you wanna use like a multi-camera shoot, you can just open a different um, browser instance and then pull in that camera and create, create another kind of camera shoot and you can switch back and forth between cameras. I'm planning on doing that in here with my studios. I can switch camera angles in here. So yeah, so, that's but, good. But this whole issue with the mute button, I'm not quite sure. I'll, I'll have to pass that along to the stream team or the StreamYard team and let them take a look at that question. So we'll I did we'll see Dr. Vibe had a question here. He said, LC people have been able to post their podcast on YouTube for a long time. What do you think people are now jumping on the bandwagon? Well, I think it's because of exposure. It's the, There's a lot more people talking about podcasts everywhere. And there's also a lot of people who are talking about podcasts that happen to be a little bit more celebrity and have mm -hmm. bigger, pe pe bigger platforms. And they say my podcast and are on a video. 
right. and so people want to know, oh, a podcast. I want to have a podcast too, and 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 therefore it's sort of like, um, you know, when you are talking and somebody uses a vocabulary word you've never heard before, and then all of a sudden everybody's saying that word, and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. everybody's using the word. That's what this was like. It was always there. People are always have have actually been doing it for a long time. But like the cloak, it's like the eyes all of a sudden opened up and they're like video podcast. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. You know, so yeah. I think it was really awareness. People became aware because more people started to use other things and Spotify and, you know, call her daddy and. Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan. And I think Rogan was doing it for so long that, uh, that nobody became aware of video podcasts because of Joe Rogan. I think right. more people became aware of video podcasts from the new people starting the newer generation because they were like, Oh, what is that? Right. I didn't know that people who didn't know Joe Rogan. I know, I know there are people who don't know who Joe Rogan is. I'm telling you, I know yeah. you don't believe me. But but the younger people are like, oh, that's a podcast. I didn't know it was a podcast. And the first podcast they were exposed to was Alex Earl's podcast. Right. Alex Earl reaches a very, very young audience. They yeah. are now wanting to create their own, you know, so it's a different and they don't know Joe York Rogan. So um, it becomes a little bit. Yeah, I think it also. I think you tapped on a real important point there, Elsie, is that um, the, the whole YouTube thing is a generational shift. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about the early days of YouTube, it, it was, you know, the, the 14 and 15 year olds and that were in there and those, those kids have grown up, right? And now they're older and now they're more professional and we're seeing them still like their YouTube and their interests are expanding because that's, that's one thing about I've always said about podcast consumers is that they grow up, <laughs> they get older over yeah. time and their, their interests kind of adjust and change. And, and I think we're seeing that right now as the earlier generation of podcast listeners is getting older. And now we're also seeing the older generation of podcast listeners start to grow as the baby boomers kind of move into retirement. Mm -hmm. So, and then this younger generation that was consuming on YouTube is now moving into their prime podcast consuming years in their thirties and things like yeah. that. And, and so that's why we're seeing what we're having this growth. Uh, but also we're seeing at the, the younger spectrum, the, what the 18 to 24 age group is the fastest growing podcast consumer. Um, so this is, this is a generational shift that we're seeing happen here. And I think it's, it's re really, really interesting to follow this. And it's oftentimes easy to get kind of misplaced in our perception of what's happening, but there's major demographic generational shifts that are happening right now mm -hmm. um, that are, I, I think, having a big impact on all this stuff. But Oh, yeah. Well, let's let's go ahead and jump to the giveaway. I know we're getting uh, past the bottom of the hour here. Um, so we... We, we don't want to stretch everybody out too long here, Elsie, about, so if you haven't applied, uh, which I've seen a lot of folks uh, type into their comment field to um, add their name to the drawing list to win a Puddles duck and uh, a, a Puddles uh, StreamYard mug. And I will send that to you in a, uh, if you send me an email. So if you're selected as a winner of this, just send me an email with uh, your mailing address and I will, and that you won and who you are and all the stuff like that. And I will um, forward that on to the StreamYard team and we'll get that shipped out to you. So I, I appreciate everybody being here and it's been amazing to have Elsie with me for this long to talk about some very deep topics tonight. So Elsie, we've, we've, we pulled back another layer of the onion and gotten <laughs> deeper on this than I know. Than yes, we did. Right. Oh my God. I don't think I've gone as deep in, in the show <laughs> as I have with you. So it's, it's basically, but I totally anticipated that. So let's, let, let's go ahead and uh, pull, pull the drawstring here. If you haven't entered, please do so. Oh and my goodness. I, We've got I, all kinds of people in there with all doing their stuff. That's so good. All I'm right, here we go. On the screen and let's, uh, Play play a little music in the background, and we can find ourselves a a, a winner here. So that's the 
that's the goal that I have here is to give away swag. Um, that's my whole purpose. Oh, wow. Here. You have a whole like. Right. Well, that's that's StreamYard. They, they have all these tools and stuff. And this <laughs> this giveaway tool that, that I'm has using a different, here. Has a little so, song. Well, it, it doesn't actually. I'm I'm th this is my show song. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but this is a free tool that's available to all the plan users of uh, StreamYard. Uh, it's at StreamYard.com forward slash uh, giveaway. And you can use it if you have a, uh, a plan with StreamYard. So it's really as simple as launching it while you're doing your show or just prior to doing your show and identify um, what show that you're doing because it, it identifies with your account. So it associates with your account already automatically. And you just set your hashtag and and basically turn it on and it captures all those hashtags from all the comments and collates it into a, a giveaway experience. So let's go ahead and pull the drawstring. Good luck, everybody out there. Let's do it. All right, Rudy. Thank you so much. Um, right on. It's fantastic. Uh, send me an email, rob.greenly at gmail.com with your mailing address, and we'd be happy to send you some merch. So you too can have a Puddles Duck. So come back and join me next Thursday for another episode of uh, Podcast Tips with Rob Greenly. <laughs> so thank you so much, Elsie, for jumping on the line and joining me um, and doing doing such a terrific episode. So how did I do that? That Yay. doesn't look right. Let me uh, change that. So Elsie, thank you so much and good luck with the rest of your week. And thank you everybody out there for spending so much time with us tonight. It was great to have you with us and, Yay. and, and this deep conversation. Awesome. And the deep <laughs> conversation. Thank you so much, everybody. You okay. guys are amazing. Sorry if I didn't get to your comment or your question in the chat. Um, we did our best to try and get through it. So thank oh, you yeah. so much. Keep keep commenting, and I'll, I'll I'll get into the comments in YouTube and some of the other platforms, and I'll try and answer your your questions. So thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody.